felizes que ele tá, que ele tá aqui com a gente. Então, sem mais demora, por favor, é. Stephen Coles. É. newspaper uh, in, in school, and, and that helped me gain my love for it. But I never really thought too deeply about the really internal reasons why type uh, had this resonance for me. And, uh, but I'm starting to find these connections that actually might help to explain. And, and it might be useful to you as well as, as, as other type lovers. Uh, do you guys know this word? This might, I hope this is translatable. Uh, synesthesia is this condition that some people have where uh, they might, well, here's the long definition, but nobody will want to read that. Uh, but they, they'll, they'll get one sense, you, you see something, and then maybe seeing that object, you immediately hear something. Or if you see a number, you immediately think of a color. Uh, this is that condition where you're, you're crossing two different uh, stimulus pathways. And I, I have a bit of that that is directly related to typography. For example, this is what I hear in my head when I see this. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. So, I mean, this obviously makes some sense to you, so maybe you guys can give this next one a try. Nice, nice. How about this? Beautiful. I knew that Brazilians were, Mex were musical people, but this <laughs> really proves it. Oh, interesting. I haven't heard monkey noises before. That was weird. Uh, but there's this whole other kind of typographic synesthesia, which is uh, that some typefaces immediately evoke certain colors. Uh, 
what color does this typeface bring to mind? So a lot of people said pink. That, that's what it says to me, hot pink. And uh, there, there are autom automatically this kind of connection with uh, the people who use Mistral as well. Uh, this is an interesting kind of connection to make with what some people thought was going to be an action film. Uh, but when you see this typeface used there, you, you get this kind of feeling that mm, there's something different going on with this, uh, with this movie. And, and it's true, it wasn't a typical action film. What color do you think of when you see Helvetica, even if it's not in a color? For me, it's red, Swiss red, of course. And then Cooper Black, I actually don't think of black. Uh, I think of a brown. And it might be these uh, gooey, chocolatey shapes. Uh, but that might automatically come from Tootsie Roll, which I don't know if you guys have that here, but it's, a, it's very common in the US. And that's the typeface that's associated with Tootsie Roll. So these connections remind us that the type can immediately conjure certain feelings, uh, emotions, cultural experiences uh, in the reader's mind. Uh, it has power. And that influence is, it can often be very subtle, uh, but it's important. And we'll get back to that in a moment. But, but first, how can I explain how I got to the point where so much of my brain is occupied by fonts and the identification of type and uh, these kinds of connections that I explained, uh, that I, yeah, that I get start getting this kind of synesthesia. Uh, how does it become an obsession? So I'm gonna go back to my youth and explain a little bit of a story. It's a kind of a digression, but I think it will, uh, it'll help you see that where you start kind of forms the, th the way you th see things for the rest of your life. Mom and dad. Uh, here they are in the Alps. Uh, my mom is Swedish, and my father met her in the U.S. after she immigrated to the U.S., but uh, they then traveled quite a bit uh, in Europe. This is in the late 50s. This is, again, in the Alps 12 years later. And they brought back from there uh, these posters. They weren't designers, uh, uh, but my dad was in publishing, and he had a sense for it. And they went all over Europe and brought back uh, lots of beautiful things. Uh, and, and travel posters, as you know, were much more common uh, back when we used travel agents. And we went to a place and actually got inspired by where we should go and visit. And uh, now that all happens online. And there aren't travel agents so, so much. But we were missing out on this. Uh, I love the lettering on this one, and it's, it's a script style that we would not see in the US uh, very much, especially uh, you know, the, my lifetime. Uh, you know, starting in the 70s uh, to now, it's very uncommon. It, it's a very European kind of script. And these are from Austria. And Paris. And along with uh, that kind of influence, they also brought back with them a Scandinavian sense of uh, interior design and architecture, uh, this kind of simple, natural modernism. Uh, this is a pretty good representation of what our kitchen looked like. And in the living room, we had an Eames lounge chair. Uh, actually, ours was a ply craft, which is what some people would call a knockoff of an Eames. But we'll get into knockoffs later. Uh, to me, this was your standard comfort, uh, comfortable chair. It's what you, uh, what what my father sat in to read a book to me, and here he is doing just that uh, later in life with my with my nephew. Also, in the living room, we had a pair of Barcelona chairs uh, that we sat side by side, and that was our sofa. So this is what I grew up with, and again, to me, these were just your standard living room objects. This is what made a, a living room. Uh, and we weren't wealthy, but my dad uh, ran a small magazine. And he would, uh, a f local furniture company would advertise in the magazine. And then to pay for part of the ad, then we would get some furniture. And because my parents had this great taste that they brought back with them from their travels and their heritage, uh, this is what I got to grow up with. And, I, and I, I was lucky, and I was maybe a little sheltered, 
uh, because as I got a little older and visited the homes of my neighbors and friends, I began to realize that this is what most Americans consider to be a living room or a comfortable lounge chair. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a lazy boy. Uh, to me, this is, uh, you know, to some people, this might be pure comfort. It just feels so soft. Uh, but, and to some people, my parents' living room might have felt strange or not their ideal. And the lazy boy was actually a pretty inventive contraption. Uh, its reclining motion and its built-in footrest uh, were innovations uh, when, when, when it came out uh, in the mid-50s. Uh, and this is one of the ads uh, from, from when it was introduced. Uh, and you can kind of get an idea of what life was like in America at that time. I shouldn't say America. By the way, throw something at me when I say America. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed by that habit now. Uh, in the U.S., when it was released, this is the kind of ad uh, that came out. It says, uh, uh, Lazy Boy appealed to both sexes with the high-low matic. This innovative design featured an adjustable back that could be raised to accommodate a man's comfort needs and lowered to appeal to the aesthetic desires of the woman of the house. I guess that women care about what things look like and men just need to le lean back and be comfortable. Uh, but to me, this chair felt very strange when I first saw it, and it still does. And yes, they make this exact model still today probably with this kind of weird eggplant color, this purple color. Uh, and, it, and it feels really dated to me. And while the immediate impression is this softness and comfort, in practice, it's actually not that comfortable long term. Uh, there's very little support, and the whole thing uh, is subject to losing its structure over time. It, it wears quite easily. We'll get back to chairs in a minute. Now we're really going to go off on a diversion. How can this relate to type? Well, before I was into fonts, I was into birds. It started very young with bird watching. And these were a few of the books that I used. I volunteered at a local aviary, uh, a zoo for, for birds. And I attended the uh, Audubon meetings. Uh, uh, it was me and a bunch of uh, old ladies. I was a 12-year-old kid. It was very strange. And this is the book that actually followed me into the Amazon rainforest. I, I visited Ecuador. Uh, and it actually followed me into the river itself. Uh, I fell out of the boat on a bad voyage, but that's another story. And this is my everyday guide. This is the thing that I used most often. And birders and font geeks have so much in common. Uh, they're both acute observers, uh, of course, because they're, they're watching what's around them. But they're also obsessed with things like classification and anatomy and minute details that distinguish different types of things. And what else are they obsessed with? They're obsessed with identification, of course. They must identify everything that they see. And of course, they have to correct people when they get it wrong. And birders are also really into documentation. Uh, they frequently keep checklists of uh, the species that they've seen. Uh, on a particular trip. I have a big stack of these from my bird watching days. And they also have a main list, a life list, they call it, which uh, tracks all the birds that they've seen over their life. And sometimes I think it would be nice if designers had a life list of the typefaces that they used. I think some of our lists would be longer than others. More of that later. So that brings me to step three in the raising of a font geek. Uh, this is my first entry into the world of type. For those of you who don't know it, this is exactly what it says on the cover. It's a big book of fonts. And big is putting it uh, really mildly. This is really a hefty volume. Uh, in, the, in this 1998 edition, uh, there were something like 30,000 samples, uh, six or 700 pages. And this copy here looks very much like the one that I first encountered as a freshman my first year in college. Uh, I was working uh, as a typesetter at the newspaper, and there was one of these in the office. I was immediately fascinated with it. What was significant about this book is that it was like uh, in a, what in, we'd say in the U.S. is the Sears Roebuck catalog. Uh, it has all the manufacturers in one book, so you can compare and you can shop. 
And it was well used, this copy that I found. It was dog-eared, it had marked pages, it was nearly falling apart. Much like uh, these other examples that you see here. And here's one uh, belonging to the German editors of Slanted Magazine. They've, they've given up on the binding altogether and they've just put things in this, this strange rotisserie contraption. But that's how important it is to people, uh, especially at that time, is that they would just keep using it until it completely fell apart. And this book opened up my mind to this idea of typographic diversity. That uh, there's the, the notion that there's this vast rich landscape out there beyond what I knew from the Adobe bundle or for the fonts that came with my Mac when we first got a Mac. And of course, a catalog of related and distinct species of type was very similar, or very familiar to me. And you know, after all of that time as bird watchers, as a bird watcher, with all the guides, the bird watching guides. And then I became fixated on these little side notes that you see here, uh, the little see also eyeball. Uh, it led you to similar related typefaces. And I started scribbling my own additions in these margins and making little corrections to designers and dates that I found that were wrong. And a lot of these actually ended up in the next edition of the book because I was fortunate enough to be hired by Font Shop uh, a few years later. And soon after my introduction to type, I realized that the things that fascinated me most uh, were those things that most of us ignore. Those things that are all around us uh, that most people consider mundane or uh, they don't even notice are actually full of variety and, and history and psychological power. And these can be parts of the natural world like birds or plants or clouds, uh, but they can be part of the man-made world as well, the designed world, uh, even the parts that most people don't consider to be designed, doorknobs, silverware, uh, the guardrail on a highway. Now those of us here in this room, we know that these things are industrial or graphic design. But most of the world obviously doesn't give these objects a second thought. Uh, and perhaps the most elemental and uh, ubiquitous of these things is type. And over the years I found that one of the ways to explain how type works to students or to clients or to uh, other professionals is to relate it to these everyday things. So I'm going to submit to you this metaphor. A page is like a room and type is the furniture. When you enter a room, you notice the arrangement of the furniture. And then as you focus on each piece, uh, you think you notice its shape. Uh, and aesthetics have value at that point. Uh, but once you sit down, the look of the chair doesn't matter that much anymore. Uh, you're concentrating on other things, you know, whatever it is that you came into the room to do. And, but if you can't concentrate on those things, if the chair doesn't let you because it's too ostentatious uh, or poorly designed for sitting, then it's a bad chair. And this metaphor can work for all sorts of things, of course, it, it, spoons or architecture. So if the type, if the headlines, the text, uh, is furniture and their arrangement is typography, then we can think of a typeface as a chair. These two designed objects have an incredible amount in common. For most people, chairs are part of their everyday life. They sit, they use them throughout the day, uh, from the kitchen counter stool to the desk chair, uh, to the restaurant booth, um, to the lounge chair in front of the TV. And as they go through life sitting in various kinds of furniture, they don't think twice about it, uh, unless something feels wrong, like I said. Then they know immediately that the chair isn't right for the purpose, even if they may not be able to explain why that is. So let's dig into this a little bit. This is what most of us would think of as a chair. If, we just, if I said, picture in your head a chair, uh, this is what you might see. Just in its barest form, its four legs, a seat, uh, and a back. But there's so many ways that you could get to this point. Yeah, there has to be a surface that you sit on, uh, but then everything else is variable. You could have three legs, or you could have no legs at all. This chair is mounted to the wall. So a chair can be altered in countless ways and still serve its primary function. And we know that the same thing is true of type. We start with a basic requirement, that may be the Latin alphabet. 
But as long as the typeface maintains some level of legibility, there can be countless variations on those alphabetic shapes. These are all E's. They all come from a variety of typographic models, sans serif, black letter, script. Uh, but they're all legible, especially in context with the other letters in their typeface. This diversity is as rich as it is in chair design. So what can we learn from this metaphor? Uh, perhaps it can shed some light on how type is made and used. So let's start with this, furniture and type designer crafts. To me, the key distinction between Art and craft uh, is that artwork is meant to be experienced on its own, while a craftsperson creates objects that are designed to be used. So there are very few examples that are more clear and immediate than furniture and type. Without the user, uh, they sit squarely in the category of art or decoration. Whenever we talk about crafts, we usually encounter this familiar phrase, a balance of form and function. And this is the goal of most craft. Uh, it's a balance of expression and restraint. And it's quite true of both type and, and furniture. Uh, here's an example for, uh, that may be too far on the form side of the equation. This is Henry Bertoia's diamond chair. And it's considered a modern classic. You'll see this in many, in many modern museums. Uh, it has this beautiful structure that's defined by curved steel rods. Uh, but for some people, it has a fatal flaw. And this is described uh, really eloquently by uh, a woman who had a blog where she, she was a senior at a, a design school in, in the US. And she would critique chairs that she would encounter throughout her life on, on campus. And I have to agree with what she says about Bertoia's chair. Uh, I'm quoting now. She says, two words, grid butt. <laughs> if you wear shorts and sit in these, your butt is a grid. I think these chairs are really expensive. Uh, once I saw a Facebook ad for fancy chairs, and these two, uh, these were $2,000. And then she continues with Bertoia's smaller version, uh, the side chair. And she says, uh, there are two different kinds of grid butt chairs. This is the ultimate grid butt chair. If you have exposed leg, you will get grid all up in your butt which some designy people might like, I don't know. But if I'm going to sit in a chair that's fancy and expensive, I expect my body to look the same or better when I get up from it. <laughs> so you really ought to check out Sarah Pollard's blog. It's quite good. So here we have this chair that's this beautiful object. It's one of these pieces that when you walk into a room, you might admire it. Uh, but the admiration fades for some people when they put it to use. So yes, there's this balance of form and function that's required. But that balance can change according to different conditions. So what's more important is, does the work serve the intended purpose? In broad terms, a chair provides a place to sit. A typeface conveys a message. But the means to those ends change depending on what the design needs to do. Typefaces are broadly divided into two groups, display and text. Display uh, type is allowed to be expressive. The purpose is to grab your attention and establish a mood. It's the showy chair in the hotel lobby. On the first examination, there may be no functional purpose for these audacious curves on the top of Arne Jacobson's egg chair. But they do serve a stylistic purpose uh, for someone who wants to add drama to a room. In that way, they're functional after all. What matters is what the room needs and who's entering the room. And what matters is what the page needs and who's going to be reading it. For text type, the primary goal is generally readability. We think about it, you know, text type has to be readable. It has to get out of the way so that the content can uh, come first, be the most important thing. It doesn't need to be pretty. It just needs to be readable. But so if we're this strict about that definition, we could choose to think of a uh, text typeface as a toilet. When you got to go, it doesn't matter you know, what it looks like. All you care about is if it functions, right? But it's really not that simple. Some of you know uh, about Beatrice Ward. She had a famous analogy called the Crystal Goblet, where she asserts that good typography is transparent. It doesn't obscure or distract from the text. 
And a lot of people, when they bring up that essay, they talk about this transparency or invisibility of text type. But in actuality, her essay is much more complex than that. Um, some see her analogy more as the crystal goblet is casting its own impression on the wine inside. And what about the shape of the glass? That too has an influence. In fact, the more interesting part of the essay, I think, is the part that most people overlook, where she considers that one should consider typography as windows uh, with panes, uh, you know, bordered by, by wooden panes or metal panes. Uh, and in that case, somebody is aware uh, that someone has made an effort. You can see through the window, but there's also something that's framing it, that's putting it in context with the building. So it's not invisible like a plate glass window where there is nothing but what's in front of you. And so that way, I think that you can see that there's something more to a text typeface. So any search for an absolutely functional typeface would be in vain. Typefaces can't be purely neutral. They always give the reader an impression based on the reader's own experience or based on the historical or cultural context uh, of the content. The reader can be just as important uh, as the designer, uh, what they wish, and they probably should be more important. So another consideration for type selection is the personal preferences and biases of the reader. Let's look at this paragraph of text. It's kind of difficult maybe to see at this size from the projection, but uh, this is uh, Facht by uh, Thomas uh, uh, Timek, and it's kind of in a Helvetica model, um, you know, very plain and simple and clear. And to some readers, the most comfortable text face might be, might be this, you know, as, with as little adornment as possible. Um, and, you know, that might be what they find comfortable for reading. It has proportions, they're optimized for body copy, yet it's still quite modern and compact. If we were to compare it to a lounge chair, it might be like the Heron, uh, a rocker that was manufactured in the 60s and 70s by a Japanese company, Tendo Moko. It's really spare in its design, uh, but it's also comfortable and it's versatile. I actually use this as my working chair. I sit in it when I'm working at home, put a pillow on my lap and my laptop on top, and I can work for hours. Uh, but some folks might take a look at this chair and they would be completely turned off. And the same goes for this text. For some readers or for some content or contexts, the fact would be too spare. Perhaps the audience is older or they're more traditional or they're more accustomed to standard book text to type with some meat on its bones. And to them, the more unobtrusive, more familiar text might be Gaudi Old Style, very different. And their idea of a comfortable, familiar chair might be the lazy boy. Now, I'm kind of making fun of Gaudi, but these are just two extremes kind of on, on, on the spectrum to give you an example of how things can change and how the feeling of the reader uh, can be completely different. If something wants, if you want something to be read, it has to appeal to the reader. Readability isn't just can you read it, how fast can you read it. It's also do you want to read it. The context uh, of the use itself is also a consideration. Where is the type going to appear? Is it on paper or screen, big or small? Uh, let's take the size, for example. Both chair and type design, very small changes in proportion make a huge difference. The Eames plywood lounge chair is an early classic and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, it was a very practical design because it could be mass produced for a much lower cost than other designs of the era. But you can't take this chair and pull it up to a dining table. Uh, it has an angled back and it's got a low seat. Um, it's, it's meant to be you know, a lounge chair, to be relaxed in. You'd feel really silly trying to eat with your arms up above your head like this. But the Eames also developed a dining chair with the same general design. Uh, its angle's more upright, uh, the tape, uh, and it's at a height that's going to fit to a table. It's more appropriate to the height of the table. It's one core design uh, with two additions. 
And the advantage of this for uh, the manufacturer is that they could use many of the same parts uh, and production techniques for both models of chair. And the advantage to the consumer was that they could create a multi-purpose environment in their home using the same kind of elements, you know, harmonious elements. And this exists in the font world too, uh, in the form of super family. You've got families with one core design principle, but variations in classification, such as sans or slab and serif, or in optical size. You know, metal type being a physical object had specific design for each size. Large type had sharp details, a high stroke contrast often. And then as type got smaller in the design, it, they compensated by strengthening the hairline strokes, widening the structure to keep the counters open. And very small changes in proportion made a big difference in legibility at different sizes. But yet they maintained the style of the design. You see each of these letters in the design they were meant to be, it felt very cohesive as the same type did. But then of course we lost this uh, when phototype setting took over and then digital technology soon after because then type could be scaled to any size. Designers had one typeface design for all sizes and that was, that was useful, but we soon understood that in type, one size doesn't always fit all. And fortunately, uh, contemporary type makers are bringing back the concept of optical sizes or size specific design. And one example of this is Benton Modern. This is a modern take on the century that we just saw in the previous slide. And it's not the only one, but it's unique because it restores this idea of size specific cuts. And this is even more beneficial on the screen uh, where resolution is, is often low. If you're setting small text, it allows for the lowercase to use more pixels and it makes the stroke sturdier and forms uh, wider to maintain clarity. And there are very good reasons why then it makes sense for type designers to keep designing, to keep creating new and original designs, but also to look back from the old stuff to see what they can learn. And it leads, it leads me to one uh, thing that is also true of both type and chairs. We still need more. Uh, Massimo Vignelli, who recently passed away, uh, I'm a big fan of him and I didn't mean to crop this to insult him. I think he's a great guy. Uh, it just happened to be where it was in the, in the video. But he's actually, in this video, you should watch it. He's this kind of jovial guy. He's, 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 he's friendly, he's smiling, he he's, shows his personality. But then if you uh, read some of his philosophies, you might think that he's a, a pretty harsh character. The life of a designer is a life of fight against the ugliness. I think, I don't know if he'd get along with some of Tony's point of views. And he also said this, uh, in the computer age, the proliferation of typefaces and type manipulation represents a new level of visual pollution threatening our culture. Out of thousands of typefaces, all we need are a few basics, basic ones and then we can trash the rest. Uh, and so this is what has become very famously known as Vignelli's uh, typefaces. Sometimes it's six, five, four, but this handful of typefaces that he approved of and that he used. But you have to understand that the climate uh, of the design world when he said this. Uh, he said this when the Mac had first come out and people started experimenting and making new fonts without maybe any training at all. And a lot of it was really bad. And this was also the era of uh, David Carson and grunge. Um, so he was reacting to that. But also I know that he didn't strictly mean it. And it's easy to explain why because of these guys, Ray and Charles Eames. Uh, these designers whose work you've already seen earlier, they were working at the same time as Vignelli. And imagine if someone said to Charles Eames uh, early in his career that the chair had already been designed. We already have that, Chuck. It's uh, four legs, it's a seat, what else do you need? Why reinvent the wheel? But then of course we wouldn't have this or this. And it's because of the Eames and people like them even Vignelli himself, who designed furniture as well and lots of objects. I have uh, a set of plates that he designed uh, that is um, it's amazing. I know that if he was hard pressed, he wouldn't have been so hard nosed about his rule. 
And new chair design didn't stop with the Eames, of course. Uh, Vitra, who sells Eames designs uh, in, in Europe, uh, they also sell newer pieces uh, by the Burlick brothers of France. And the Burlick brothers soft shell, shell chair is very similar to this one on the left by the Eames at first glance. But when you get to uh, actually experience it and uh, you, you view it at closer examination, it, you can see it has a larger seat and a softer structure. So to quote my friend Indra Kupferschmidt, why would Vitra produce a new chair by the Burlex when they're still selling this one by the Eames? Because customers have different applications, tastes, budgets, and bottoms. <laughs> Designers are always improving things. They're always reworking or reimagining them for new audiences and new purposes. And type's not exempt from this. We don't have to live with the same five or 10 classic typefaces or even the same version of the classics because there's no single Baskerville, right? There's no single Garamond. They're all, the ones that we use are all interpretations of those designs. So let's look at some of the reasons why you might go back and think again about some of these classics. Let's kill a sacred cow. It's kind of cropped at the top, but this is Gil Sands. And this is a designer's favorite and it's this nice appealing mix of geometry and, and humanism, and it's clear and it's readable and it's, it's got a good personality to it. Uh, but there's this common misconception that typefaces like this one are infallible and can't be improved on. And there's plenty to improve on this, or at least to reinterpret. Uh, start with the beginning of the alphabet. Here's the A that we usually associate with Gil Sands. Oh, thank you, I moved down. The A looks better already. Um, but actually, this is only one of the versions that Gill drew, Eric Gill. It's only the one that we know because that's the one that came to the digital uh, version of Gill Sands that most of us use. Gill actually drew a few different shapes for the A, and this is one that I would consider to be a more elegant shape on the right. And this one was extracted from a letterpress print by Phil Baines who has uh, the wood edition of Gil Sands, which at a larger size had this type of A. But because this other A didn't make it to the digital version, then you know this is what we think is Gil Sand, Sands. We, we ended up with this little uh, flipped up tail. And it becomes much more abrupt when you see it in the lightweight. Uh, and so I feel like that's not really in tune with the rest of the design. But if, if you feel, you know, it's okay, let's ignore that for a moment, and let's just look at the weights. Here's the regular weight. This looks like a natural progression. But then here comes the bolt, throwing the whole system out of whack. They're not at the same X height anymore. And this is going to cause some problems if you're going to use the bold for emphasis within the same line. And then there's this character. This is Gil Sands Ultra Bold, or Gil Keo. It's an amusing and really delightful character, to be sure, but it's kind of a distant relative of the rest of the Gil Sands family. And that's not to say that there isn't a place for families that really change character as they go through the weights. And in fact, that's less common now that uh, type designers are using interpret interpretation or interpolation to create these weights. But it's not always what the user expects uh, when, they, when they get a family. Uh, and it may not be what they need. And that's where contemporary type designers come in and they add something new to the old models. Uh, this is F.F. Milo by Michael Abink. And you can see that he was clearly influenced by Gil Sands with a lot of these shapes and these proportions. But he's made a much more harmonious family for more contemporary purposes. Let's look at Gil Sands from the perspective of an interaction designer. Uh, or someone who uses a lot of numbers or data. Uh, legibility, obviously, is going to be really important here, perhaps for displaying data, for entering a form. What three characters are these? They're actually three totally different characters. Maybe it helps if we show the same characters in Noia Helvetica. But still, we're not quite sure, you know, what is the I and what is the L? And once we see it in a serif, we can kind of distinguish, OK, that's, we're looking at an I, a 1, and a lowercase l. Now, obviously, it's easier to distinguish these characters when there's a serif, like Benton Modern here. Uh, but sans serifs don't have to be designed this way. Uh, for example, let's compare it to F.F. Milo, 
who uh, has this old style figure, so it's shorter, has the bar at the top. The L is slightly taller, but if legibility is really important for the job, maybe it makes sense to use a typeface that immediately has distinctive characters, like Otto from underwear. The point of this isn't to show, is, is just to show that like chairs we discussed earlier, the overall feeling of a typeface might be right. We might be thinking Gil Sands is the right feeling that we have for this project. Uh, but it may not have the functional design characteristics that we need for the job. So even though Gil Sands and Helvetica are classics, we still need new designs. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, readability now. To me, readability is more of a holistic uh, ability to read a paragraph of text, whereas Legibility is the individual letter forms, distinguishing them from each other. So readability is about avoiding distraction or eye strain. It's not just uh, how easy it is to read also, but how appealing. So here's Times, another classic. Uh, but this is one that I think really deserves to be, in most cases, relegated to the past. It was designed for a very specific purpose uh, in the early 1900s for newspapers. And it has this high stroke contrast and these spindly features. They, they were all compensations for the effect of ink seeping into porous newsprint. But also, what we're looking at here is a much larger size of the metal type. That was the size that is normally digitized by many foundries. And so we're looking at some very fine details that just don't work as text. And for the luminescent pixel screen, these characteristics are actually a liability, not a benefit. So as a modern alternative, here's Arnhem. Uh, it's the same model, it's the same classic appearance, and maybe a similar level of contrast, but it's slightly sturdier, and the serifs are heavier, and they're more blunt, and the caps are uh, shorter, which gives you a page with more density, or one that allows more line spacing. And some of these details are crisper as well, uh, like the, the ball terminal on the A, without affecting the overall uh, legibility or readability. And also, you'll notice that the apertures, uh, the, the space between the exterior and the interior of the letter forms is larger, too. So in the A and the E, you've got a larger space there that's going to make them more distinguishable than an O. Another example of that would be Le Monde by Jean-Francois Porchez. But despite these very useful new designs, some people continue to use the old classics. They may be unaware or afraid of alternatives. And I'm not saying that there's no place for the classics anymore, uh, but they certainly don't deserve the reverence that they get. A lot of this is due to fear. Sometimes old typefaces are treated like religion. After they reach a certain age, uh, people assume that they came straight from God. They're unaltered and they're unchangeable. But if we've learned anything about uh, design or other things like medicine, uh, furniture, we know that that's not true. And I know it's a, a little daunting as type users to get out of your comfort zone to trust a new type. Uh, frankly, a lot of new type is crap. But there are countless new, at, at, at the same time, there are countless new foundries that are popping up everywhere. We don't know whether they're, they're, their stuff is quality. There's new newsletters and promotions. How do you know what's worth paying attention to? It can be really daunting. And one of the reasons that I do the work I do is to help make that easier. And Typographica is one means to that end. We founded this site about 12 years ago, and at that time it was just a chatty blog. People just went there to discuss things. Uh, and that had some value at the time when there weren't many places to discuss typography online. Uh, but a few years ago, we shifted the focus of this to typefaces and books. We have an annual review of the year's releases, and that has become the foundation of the site. For those of you who don't know it, we ask some people in the industry whose opinion that we admire uh, to select their favorite release of the year and just write why it interests them. And it's not really a competition where entries are submitted formally to a jury. Uh, that's a different and very valid concept. But instead, it becomes more of a broad overview of what happened in type this, uh, each year. 
And I think that this has become increasingly important. There are literally thousands of new typefaces released every year. And it's nearly impossible, even for a freak like me, to keep up with them. Let alone to pick out which ones truly deserve your attention. Uh, so the next edition, this is 2012, the next edition for, for 2014 is going to be published sometime in January, hopefully. Uh, keep tuned for that. The other way that we can judge the quality of a typeface is by seeing it in use. A little over a year ago, or actually it's now three years, I started this blog with Sam Berlow and Nick Sherman. Our goal was to raise awareness of, and appreciation of typefaces by showing them in action. Uh, we wanted to improve typographic literacy by removing some of the mystery that surrounded why certain typefaces were used uh, and demonstrating the effect that type had on a piece of design. Often you'd see design uh, you know, presented in books or magazines or awards or annuals and not always is the typeface uh, credited or mentioned when it's often the core of the design. This was something I wrote about uh, Comedy Central, a uh, a channel, uh, entertainment network in the U.S. when they rebranded. One of our founders, Sam Berlow, uh, was wandering through the mall uh, one day and noticed that almost everything he saw was in Helvetica. And so he wrote something about this. We did a little research and we saw that 15 of the top 20 uh, main retailers in the U.S. were using Helvetica as their main branding typeface at that time. And so we we wrote about it and we, taught, we had a discussion. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Why do they make these decisions? And then there in the corner uh, where you see the typeface name, you can click on that and then see all the other parts, uh, uh, entries in the database uh, that use Helvetica. And this collection's expanded rapidly over the last uh, couple of years because we recently opened it up to public submissions. So this means that anybody can upload their own work. Or, or work that they admire. And we built this very simple interface for adding a new entry. Uh, when you type in a typeface, then it automatically creates a sample for it as you add it. And then we have a bookmarklet so that you can pull stuff in from anywhere on the web. So there are now over 4,000 uh, pieces of design in the collection. And there's new stuff posted every day. And the larger the collection gets, the more useful it becomes because then you can start thinking about it for type selection, for seeing interesting combinations, for all sorts of uh, research, design research. We have a, uh, an advanced search so that you can take two typefaces and search for them together, see where they might have been used together in a design. Or say you want to know, you know, uh, you see what typography was designed during the Mad Men era, when in the mid-century, uh, modern kind of style and see what typefaces were, po were popular then. You could put in uh, a date range. And then you could filter by format as well. So you can see entries that just cover websites, for example, or industry. And then you can combine those two things, like uh, news industry and, and web format, and see news websites. Or say that you're masochistic and you want to see if Comic Sans has been used on a wine label. I heard that Vincent was here last year. I'm sorry that he's not again this year so that I can <laughs> tease him. But yes, here are some examples of Comic Sans on a wine label. How about Comic Sans on a memorial site? It's been done as well. And you can see that these people visiting this Dutch war memorial were about as happy as I was when I saw that. Just recently, there was another example of Comic Sans being used for a really serious protest in the US, uh, uh, NBA players uh, protesting something, using it on their jerseys. Uh, and they, you know, that sparks another conversation. And then the question is, should we really even be talking about the typeface? Maybe it's worth talking about whether we should be talking about the typeface. <laughs> but fonts and use uh, leads me to one more truism and that is uh, sometimes the typeface that people think is best is just the one that they is closest to them. Uh, Laura, help me do a little animation here. That's there. 
whatever chair's next to you is the one that you're going to grab first, right? This is an example of that. Uh, Dave Eggers, who runs uh, this organization and publishing company, um, he started the McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, and this was about uh, 15 years ago. The first issue was set entirely in Garamond 3. Uh, this is kind of a frumpy revival of a 1930s revival of another Garamond. But it lent a very distinctive uh, look to the journal. Uh, and they stuck with it for several issues, which made this typeface a core part of McSweeney's identity. They even brought the look uh, to the web when they, when they launched their website. Uh, it, they had to use a different Garamond at the time because uh, Adobe Garamond was the only one available to them. But they kept the kind of Victorian look with everything centered and the, the caps. And because the typeface is such an important part of the voice of this publica publication, I thought, well, I'm going to research this and write something for fonts and use about, you know, find out why he chose Garamond 3. So I found this interview where he talks about it. And I'm quoting from Dave Eggers. He says, partly because I didn't know how to use the type management software and all that. Uh, Garamond 3, you know, I like the look of it, and, and it holds really well with a lot of different forms, italics and, and small caps and all that, and it tracks out very well. And, okay, and... You know, I love the idea of the constraint in general. If you could only use one typeface, uh, how far can you take it? So you have a designer here uh, who's created this very recognizable brand and a, you know, a single typeface. But the reason for using it was essentially it was the easiest font for him to use. Now, type designers everywhere are crying when they hear a story like this. Uh, but they know that it's true. Um, the most enticing font to any designer is the one that's already in their font menu, right? And that's why the people who make and sell fonts have always wanted to find ways to get into that font menu, to remove steps between uh, the maker and the user. The Font Shop plugin that was launched a couple of years ago, it's an Adobe plugin that works in all the Adobe apps. You can actually preview, type, type it in a low-res uh, environment, but see how it works in your design. Uh, similar thing for the web is typecast, where you can see how web fonts might work in your design. And I'm low on time, so I'm not going to get into knockoffs, because that's, um, that's a talk of its own. But the plainest comparison we can make between the two crafts of chair design and type design is that there's no perfect one. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes design so interesting, it makes type design so interesting, is that users are always producing new needs, and type designers are always producing new ways to meet those needs. There's no perfect one, but we can keep trying. I hope that metaphor helps, not only for informing your own type selection process, but also if you have to articulate to you know, clients or, or your colleagues uh, the value of new and well-considered type. And if you cared more about the chairs and the furniture, uh, then you might like my other blog, Mid-Century Modernist. And I haven't updated it in a long time, but after visiting Brazil and seeing your incredible architecture, uh, I'm really getting back into the mood of do doing some more uh, modern design writing. And speaking of furniture, uh, thank you to Laura for these beautiful illustrations throughout the talk. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Marina wants to hear about knockoffs. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is a gray area, uh, obviously. There's always going to be there's there's always going to be reasons that people consider uh, a typeface in a similar style to another typeface to be a knockoff or to just be another interpretation of a of a style. Have I, lost, have I lost my... Depo, a presentação dele de volta. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, this is the Eames chair that I was talking about earlier. And when this was introduced, it was just groundbreaking. There were, you know, lots of other uh, furniture companies were struggling to just uh, come out with something that would uh, have this kind of look to it. 
Uh, and it's very similar to maybe the case when Futura was released. Within two, three years, there were countless other foundries with a very similar geometric design because it was so new and so interesting and popular at the time. Um, and, but when I think about knockoffs, I like to think about our Plycraft chair, which is the one that we used. Uh, the difference between the Plycraft and this, other than some very subtle design or look uh, aesthetic differences, is that the Plycraft can recline. And the Eames chair doesn't recline. So there's already an advantage there. The other advantage is that the Plycraft was made slightly later, uh, maybe 15 years later, and it's larger because people got larger. And it was better for taller people, for me. The Plycraft actually fits me better than, than the Eames Lounge does. And then they, the Plycraft uh, came out with this model, which is getting closer to the Lazy Boy, right? Now it has the built-in footrest. And so they're reinterpreting a design. It may have started as what somebody might call a knockoff, but they've now added new features that some people might appreciate. And so that's why this line can be blurry, is, is it adding something new to the, to the genre? And that's, that's another analogy that, that can help you when you distinguish those things. Any questions? All right, covered everything? Oh. <laughs> uh, my question for you is, um, I see you everywhere. You're like in uh, Quora. Uh, fonts and use, of course, uh, but how, what is your day-to-day, -day, uh, how, how's your typical work day like, just out of curiosity? You should, maybe you should, you should have Laura ask, answer this question because she probably suffers the most from my addictions. Um, there, there is no typical day, but I, I, you could say I live on the internet. I mean, that is my workplace. <laughs> um, I think it, it, you know, once I had left Font Shop about three years ago, um, I had to decide, you know, what, was I going to look for another full-time job, or was I going to find ways to try and make some kind of living out of doing these other things that I really love? And I fortunately kind of eked by by um, getting some fundings to start Fonts in Use. Once that got going, we could get some advertising in there that was hopefully not too intrusive. Uh, there's some advertising on Typographica, although it's very minimal. Um, and then I do consulting work. So sometimes I get a fun job where somebody who like Facebook will call and say, we're just developing this new thing, which I cannot tell you about. And uh, we you know, need some advice on the type. And that's really, that's fun work, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen that often. We need to change the computer. Nope. Lost a mic. Yeah. So we have a microphone. Go ahead, Nicole. Please. You can yell at me. I, I don't. We don't need a mic. Alguma outra pergunta? Oh, oh, I see. Can I close it? If you want to say it in Portuguese, I've got a magical device. Yeah, done. Really? Oh, I'm unplugged. It's not that magical. <laughs> okay. Wait, uh, I think I'm plugged in now. Are you there? Yes, yes. Is it done? Is it done? Yeah. Oh, now I hear you. Yes. yes. <laughs> the angel in the sky is talking to me. Oh. Eu realmente gosto de um projeto seu chamado Chromeograph. And I would like to comentasse um pouco sobre ele, assim, tipo, por que ele existe? Porque na verdade eles são um agrupado de imagens, mas elas têm uma conexão entre elas. Yeah, so he's asking about chromography, which, which it, yeah. <laughs> uh, chromography is a, a website where I'm collecting only images of uh, automobile logos or 
uh, logos, usually on vintage uh, electronics or uh, other objects that are, you know, the little metal, um, you know, logo types that are applied to an object. And what fascinated me about those initially was, uh, you know, I'm already taking pictures of things as I go into a new city. I'm taking pictures of signs and, and other kinds of typography in a city. But then, of course, the other ubiquitous thing is, is automobiles. And automobiles, if they're, you know, interesting older automobiles, have really cool lettering on them. Uh, so I started taking a lot of pictures of those. And then I started to realize there were other people that would do this because the car world, if you think the type world is nuts, the car world is really obsessed. And so there were people also doing the same thing. And so I started gathering them all together in a Flickr group. And uh, it became really interesting. You started seeing trends. Uh, you know, as things changed in car design over the years, they also changed in their logo design. Uh, they matched, you know, in a certain way the style of the overall design of the car. Uh, but then there were other interesting things about the lettering itself. You know, the reason that it came to become this kind of where all the all the baseline is connected in most of them is because they were making one object that that they could easily apply to a car, and then and so connecting those letter forms actually created this whole new genre of lettering uh, that was not necessarily popular in in print or or whatever was hand lettered. So that was what would interest me, and and I just as I collected them, I said, well, we've got all these people. Uh, it would be great if we just create a website that could be easily navigated by era or by um, uh, car manufacturer or uh, color if you just want a nice pretty page of red logos. <laughs> so that's where it came from. And that's kind of similar to fonts in use in a way, is, is gathering the knowledge of a lot of different designers and, and, the, and the content from them and trying to make some interesting sense out of it. And, it's really, I mean, that also goes back to the bird thing I was saying, is cataloging things and then trying to learn something about them through those connections. Ou seja, as pessoas obsessivas têm muito mais de uma obsessão né, em catalogam várias coisas. Mas uma pergunta rápida. <laughs> Não? What about the uh? typeface? Oh, man, who is that? No one. <laughs> I don't have a typeface. <laughs> um, I've, I've experimented with Fontstruct, which, which uh, we heard about earlier. Um, but the more I learned about, about, a good, uh, about what, requires, uh, what is required of a good uh, typeface design, the more uh, afraid I am to start. <laughs> I get very intimidated by that. And so, you know, maybe one day I'll find something that, I, that I'm really interested in. But I think. I'm lucky in that I found a very specific niche which works for me, like being a journalist or being, you know, helping create these research tools for a very specific field is, is, is unusual. And if I'm able to make it work, then I'm going to just kind of ride that train as, <laughs> as long as I can. Muito obrigada.